that's sort of a pink, pearly gray. However, you can encounter things on your way down. If you just talk to our GI fellows and ask how many of them on call got that 3 a.m. call from the emergency room about somebody came in with a food impaction in their esophagus. We've all been there. Um, once you get into the stomach, the stomach is a much larger organ, and these scopes can actually retroflex back 180 degrees. So this is the scope coming through the lower esophageal sphincter, and then the scope goes 180 degrees around. You're looking back at that area. These are the big rugal folds in the proximal stomach. And here's another look at them. And these produce copious mucus, which is fairly easy to see. The light is glistening off it because this is all, of course, very moist with a lot of mucus on it. Further down, you get into the antrum of the stomach. The folds uh, disappear, and you have more of a smooth, op uh, smooth lining. And in the distance is the opening of the pylorus. Again, we often find foreign bodies, interesting things on the way, and try to figure out how to get them out or deal with them. The gastric motility, which you'll see more about. There's a video online for all of you to look at. And Dr. Wiley will be talking about GI motility later this week. There's big uh, motility motions of squeezing and pushing that go through the antrum, pushing things toward the pylorus. And this is one of those, an those antral contraction rings. And the pylorus opening is right in there. Once you get into the duodenum, the duodenum itself, once you get past the bulb, has circular folds, the valvuli conaventes, which makes it easy, easy to recognize where you are. At the other end, we have, to go in from, we have to go in from what are called natural orifices. And there's actually a whole new field of GI research called notes surgery, natural orifice trans wall surgery. Um, we're not even going there. It's right now only done in pigs. But the idea is you take a scope, you go down, you puncture through the wall, the bowel, then you're into the peritoneum and you do some surgical procedure. So far, GI is still staying within the tube. But to get into the colon, you have to go in through the anus where there's this external and internal anal sphincter. And again, you can retroflex inside the rectum, which is a fairly wide structure. And looking back, this is, the again, the, the sphincter here. And these are dilated veins the, in the blue. And if those get large and bulging, those are hemorrhoids. The rectum itself is quite wide, has a thin mucosa with readily visible veins. So you can imagine if there are small defects or cuts there, this could bleed fairly easily. The sigmoid colon is sort of S-shaped and has these valves and folds that go partway around. Again, you can see the mucosa and the underlying vessels very well. The descending colon on the left side uh, is straighter but very similar. And then you get up to the splenic flexure and have to do a 90-degree turn. And occasionally we run into things there also. The transverse colon tends to have these more triangular folds, which is one reason, one way we can tell we're there. Again, the transverse colon. Um, again, you have to do another 90-degree turn at the liver. And actually, there's a bluish color through the mucosa here, which is actually the, the purple liver sitting right on top of the transverse colon. And then down into the ascending colon with these folds that do not go all the way around, the haustral folds. And into the cecum, there's a thickened area here, which is where the small intestine enters. It's the ileocecal valve. And it looks like this plumper area. And it's just under that fold that the small intestine enters. Um, and then you sometimes can do another turn there and get into the ileum, which has the smaller folds that go all the way around. And it's a narrower tube. So upper endoscopy, or EGD, esophagogastroduodenoscopy, views from the mouth to about the mid-duodenum. Occasionally, we can get a little bit further. Probably rarely do we ever get to the jejunum. Lower endoscopy, or colonoscopy, gets to, from the anus to the cecum or just into the end of the terminal ileum. That leaves a whole lot of bowel behind. And in the last uh, decade, there's been the development of capsule endoscopy as a way of trying to see the small bowel. Now, it turns out we've been very lucky. 
the small bowel doesn't have a lot of diseases in it compared to these other areas. So our endoscopy has actually done very well. But there are things we want to go look for in the small bowel. And so with the miniaturization of devices, this was developed. It's a small capsule. It's about as big as the last digit, the last, the phalanx of your thumb. But patients can actually swallow it. It's got a battery that lasts about six or seven hours. It's got a light, it's got a camera, and it's got a radio transmitter, and that's it. And patients wear on their belt the radio receiver with a little computer hard drive. And as this tumbles through the bowel, it takes about 40 to 50,000 pictures. And then someone has to look at those. Fortunately, they've been strung together as a video. Um, so far, we cannot guide this thing. The holy grail right now for gastroenterologists is to have the little joystick and guide this thing as it moves down the small bowel, but we can't do that yet. Uh, but it works. It can identify bleeding sites by looking at the mucosa. And this is just the rigid. It shows you the size compared to a human hand. Now, if we find something in the small bowel, how do we get at it short of surgery? Because again, the goal is to minimize risk. There's been the development of something called double balloon endoscopy, which does allow us to get down into the small bowel. You can actually go up from the colon as well. And that get, drags a full endoscope, and it has channels through which you can put little instruments to get biopsies, treat bleeding lesions, things like that. It's an over tube with a scope that slides through it, and each one has a balloon. So when you get to some place, you can blow up the balloon to hold your position there and then slide the other one further down. So I think it was an inchworm working its way down the bowel. But it does allow us to do some things. We have that available here. So when you're on the wards, you might see some patients who are going to undergo double balloon endoscopy. So what can the capsule show us? Well, it's random pictures, but it can actually show us quite a bit. And here you're seeing the normal mucosa. And it looks a little fuzzy because those are all the little villi. Um, you can see little lumps in the mucosa. Those are lymphoid aggregates, which is normal. You can see ulcers. These are ulcerations in the mucosa with a white necrotic base. It's got white cells and stuff there. And these can be usually the Crohn's disease, which you'll hear about, or effects of some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You can see blood appearing, and then you try to figure out where the blood's coming from. They have little abnormal blood vessels there, arteriovenous malformations. And you can see strictures, which is narrowing. Again, something that on rare occasions, Motrin can, can do some interesting things. Uh, there's a free website, the Dave Project, which has lots of images. People collect these. They upload them. It's the GI equivalent of YouTube. Um, so I wanted to show you a couple of quick animations of upper and lower views of the bowel. Um, and these are also posted on C-Tools. There's a motility video there that I want you all to look at. Um, it was done by the AGA, the American Gastroenterological Association. Most of it's cartoons, but it also shows some interesting live, animation, uh, live pictures uh, using radio-opaque material and taking x-ray movies and gives you a better grounding in some of the motility issues. And Dr. Wiley, later this week, will talk to you about the diseases of that motility. And you can watch that at the faster speed also. So let me show you these two videos. These are courtesy of Johns Hopkins University. Somebody there put a lot of time and effort into making these cartoons. So this is an upper endoscopy. And this is looking at the back of the mouth. I know you've all been looking at the uvula rising when you've done your neurologic exams. This is their depiction, the papillae on the tongue. You actually have to make about a 90 degree curve there, which is fairly blind. And then go through the, go past the vocal cords, hopefully we're not doing a bronchoscopy, into the esophagus where you may encounter some gastric acid coming back as acid reflux. And then as you go through the esophagus, get into the stomach. In this case, the patient has atrophic gastritis. They've lost the rugal folds. And here's a nice big gastric cancer with bleeding. And we go down into the antrum and find a nice gastric ulcer there. And see that go into the duodenum. And there's a nice duodenal ulcer here. 
then we end up down in the small intestine, and right here is the ampulla of water where the bile duct and the pancreatic duct are emptying. That's about as far as we can get with a standard upper endoscope. With the colonoscope, uh, we actually always look at the patient before we put the colonoscope in. And this is an external view showing external hemorrhoids around the anus. And when you're in the, re in the colon, you can often see these outpouchings called diverticuli. There are polyps. You're going to hear lots more about these. Here's flat polyps or sessile polyps. This is a large, this is a big area of inflammation and ulceration, inflammatory bowel disease, for example. Here's a large fungating, ulcerated, bleeding colon cancer. And then you get down into the cecum, um, and that's the end of the uh, lower endoscopy. Um, so with that introduction, um, what we're going to do is take a break until 9.10, and then we'll start with the first lecture, which is on peptic ulcer disease and esophagitis. So we'll take a break now and be glad to answer any questions that anyone has.